We are this morning at uh, Leviticus 18, and we'll begin there in just a moment. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you on this day, as on every Lord's Day, to pray that you will honor the teaching and preaching of your word in the course of this day, and that your people will honor your word. And Father, we know that means not only respecting it, but acknowledging that it is indeed your word, and understanding that every single word of your scripture is addressed to us as your people. And thus we pray, as we continue to work our way through the book of Leviticus, that we will see everything you would have us to see, hear everything you would have us to hear, and do everything you would have us to do. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, indeed, we are at Leviticus chapter 18 this morning, and we will work our way through this chapter. It is a unitary whole. It's one of those chapters where when you look at... Uh, say what Robert Stephanus did in 1550 in uh, dividing the scripture into uh, chapters and verses, uh, a remarkable thing, but which by the way, let me just remind you, was one of the artifacts of the Reformation, it's evidence of the Reformation, because it was the preaching of the Word of God that required chapter and verse division, so long as it was just something of a priestly duty, you know, spoken in Latin behind a rude screen, uh, God's people did not have access to the scriptures, uh, they physically did not have access to it. They, they had no need of reference to chapter or verse. And this is actually not just a product of the Reformation, it's a product of the Genevan Reformation. Robert Stephanus was uh, well known as a translator and, uh, and, and uh, excuse me, as a uh, printer, what we would now call a publisher uh, there in Geneva. And uh, as he was in, involved in print, he had to think in terms of print, and uh, it was he who was, in the main, responsible for the chapter and verse divisions that we have. In other words, the chapter and verse divisions were not done by a biblical scholar. They were done by a printer. And uh, sometimes it, it is not particularly helpful that a break comes here or there. It's a good reminder to us that the scripture was not written with these chapter and verse divisions. Thus, we should not allow them to distract us from the, the unity of the text or a natural break in the text, but it is really interesting, and in my, in my study, I have one of Stephanus's working pages from 1550, in which he, he has several different columns he's working on, and uh, so he's looking at uh, the Vulgate, he's, he's looking at, uh, at uh, other, other texts, and, uh, and he's, he, he's looking at early translations of Scripture, just to find out naturally where these breaks are, and it has been helpful to us as we're going through Leviticus, uh, because these chapter and verse divisions in Leviticus are, are, are generally quite helpful, helpful in, in where they fall, helpful in dividing uh, central parts of the, of the book of Leviticus. And just consider where we have been the last few weeks. We, we were in Leviticus chapter 15, which is a, a part of the cleanliness code, the holiness code. And uh, it is about secretions from the body. And, and what that means in terms of cleanness and uncleanness, this, uh, this, this whole idea of holiness. And the, the idea there that we need to keep in mind is at least in part wholeness, not just holiness, but wholeness. And uh, a part of that is, that, and something that evangelical Christians often miss, uh, it, it, it is that when there is an omission from the body, whether male or female, by whatever means, and remember that, uh, that they were divided between natural omissions and unnatural omissions, it, in any sense, when something has left the body, there is an incompleteness. So, so in other words, wholeness means uh, a state of non-emission. The emission means uh, something less than wholeness, and as we see, less than holiness, one reason or another. And, and, and then we found ourselves the very, ne the very next week in Leviticus chapter 16 about the Day of Atonement. And so even talking about wholeness or holiness drives us, as the Levitical law was to drive the children of Israel, to the understanding that there is no wholeness or holiness in us. Even our bodies remind us that there is no wholeness or holiness in us. And, uh, and thus, that the, the wholeness and the holiness want to come from another. And of course, if there's any passage in the book of Leviticus that foresees Jesus, 
It, it would be the Day of Atonement, which, of course, is the very foundation, in one sense, from the old covenant of our atonement theology, and as we see it in the New Testament. And then uh, last Sunday, we were in Leviticus chapter 17. Again, a very natural breakdown. And uh, you'll recall that there the Holiness Code focused on blood, and particularly upon pagan rites that involved eating and drinking blood. And uh, it was just made very clear that God's people are to have nothing to do with this, so much so that someone who does this is cut off from his people. And, uh, of course, the Christian church, at least in the West, observed last Sunday as what some call Easter, the festival of the resurrection. And uh, we just saw the radical contrast, the shocking contrast between Leviticus saying, you are never to drink this ever or be cut off from your people. And it's a, it's a horrible thing in the sight of the Lord having Jesus on the night he was betrayed give his disciples the cup and say this is my blood this is the blood of the new covenant this is my blood shed for you drink all of you of it the shockingness of that helps us to understand that radical contrast as well as the continuity between the old and new covenants but now we are at Leviticus 18 so just to remind ourselves because we, we didn't get here from nowhere we, we got here from even just uh, the turn in the beginning of chapter 15 to where we are now in Leviticus 18. We're going to work our way through this chapter. And in order to do so uh, in this particular chapter, the way it lays out, we will do it passage by passage beginning in verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Now just notice immediately, again, there, there's fascinating context here where God speaks to Moses, and he says to Moses, speak to the sons of Israel and say, in other words, this is for the entire community, for the entire covenant of commu community. This is, this is the Lord's word, and he, he identifies himself repeatedly in this passage. So in this introduction, in this Levitical code, God identifies himself repeatedly, and he makes clear that the children of Israel are his people. They, they, they are obligated to live according to his law. They are set apart from all other nations. And in particular, they are not to do as the Egyptians, and they are not to live as the Canaanites. So they are being ready to remember, at least a part of the context here, is that the children of Israel, having so recently been liberated from bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt, are headed to a land of promise, and uh, the Levitical law is given to them by, as God's gift so that they will be ready to live as God's covenant people in the land of promise. But that means profoundly not only will they live according to the, the law of God, that means they will have to live in a way that is directly contrasted with the people who are living there right now. The people they are displacing, well, the children of Israel are going to have to displace that morality as well. And the Egyptians, and included in the Egyptians, by the way, are the Hittites. And that's important because some of the things that are referenced in this text are particular uh, to the Hittites, at least in terms of what we know about ancient Egyptian religion. You are not to do what the Egyptians do. You're not to do what the Canaanites do. And all that you just have to say, uh, Egyptians and Canaanites in this sense, and it implies not only carnality, but cultic carnality. And this is one of the most interesting things because I think most Christians fail to understand that there's a pattern, we might even call it a, a Christian anthropological insight. This is just something that we should see in the Old Testament as, uh, as implying a human pattern of sinfulness. And I just suggest to you that if you're trying to understand America, in 2022, it just might help to notice very carefully what is revealed in this text. And that is that carnality perhaps inevitably 
becomes some kind of cultic carnality. Now, in the, in the cultus of the, uh, of the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Canaanites, it, it was cultic in the sense of temple prostitution. And whatever in the world we encountered in Leviticus 17 and a goat demon, uh, you know, which was clearly sensuality. And by the way, we mentioned that the, the face of the goat still represents a cultic sensuality. So, in other words, we're, we're not living in a different culture than Leviticus 15 we, we are living in a social media, digital, technology-driven Canaan. The goat demon is still very much among us. And, and so is cultic uh, carnality. And it, it isn't necessarily in the form of temple prostitution. Uh, no, it just takes other forms. But I, I think you recognize what I mean. That here again... What we have in the introduction in chapter 18 is a declaration of God's identity, thus the identity of his people, and that's contrasted with the Canaanites and the Egyptians. You shall not do as they do in Egypt. You shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. Instead, verse 4 is the theme verse, you shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. Again, I am the Lord your God. That's a possessive statement. It's not just a statement of theistic uh, confession. It, it's, a, it's a possessive statement. You're mine. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Okay, so now having that introduction, we're about to find out what the contrast between the way God's covenant people are to live uh, will be, how, what that contrast will, will mean when you look at the, uh, the peoples like the Egyptians, and in particular the Canaanites, because remember they've left Egypt. And so you might say they're supposed to make sure they bring no bad lessons learned from Egypt and they learn no new bad lessons in Canaan. Verse 6, none of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. Now, we just need to note that in this sexual code, it is primarily addressed, if not uniformly addressed, to men. Because the men of Israel are those who are responsible for the maintenance of this code. And, and that means that the sexual misbehavior of, of, of Israel is understood, likely to start with the men of Israel. It is men who are understood here to be the active agents primarily. It is two men that this is spoken. You'll understand how this lays out. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. So you say, okay, uh, interesting. Well, the Lord says, I am the Lord. You're, you're going to see this in different parts of the Old Testament. I think of the book of Lamentation sometimes. It's a very similar kind of structure. It's, it's, it's as if God knows that as we think about these things, the thing is going to get our attention, right? Especially when you're talking about sexuality. I mean, it's like all of a sudden... God's here speaking about sexuality. Well, just given who we are, I mean, just you hear about sexuality, but God says, no, back to me, back to me. I am the Lord, your God. I'm the centering issue here. I'm the authority. So verse six, none of you shall approach any of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. Now, here we also have Hebrew euphemisms for sex, for sexual intercourse even. This is a, for sexual activity, uncovering nakedness. Now, now, by the way, given the Bible's concern for modesty, very, very clear. So the, this, this could be, at the most minimal sense, an uncovering of modesty. But you do not have to be very familiar. In fact, remember, you just go back to Genesis where uncovering nakedness clearly means more than seeing a body. It's, uh, it's, it's a, a clear implication of, sexual activity. But it's limited for whom? Against uh, any close relative. Well, that, that is the, the familiar moral instinct against incest. We have a rather limited definition of incest in Western law. It's, uh, it's more limited now than it would have been at uh, sometimes uh, in the past, but it's, it's expansive in Leviticus, and that should tell us something, and yet it also tells us something that, that we won't figure this out, you know, in, 
in sexual temptation, if it's not defined carefully, then close relative might become a loose definition. So the Lord, knowing the need of his people, speaks specifically. Verse 7, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother, and you shall not uncover her nakedness. So the very first thing that's mentioned here is uh, incest that would uh, involve father or mother. And in particular, the reference here is, again, to a man as the agent and thus to the mother primarily as, as, as where the risk would be. And uh, it's, it's made very clear that that is a violation of the sexual rights of the father and, and of the sexual relationship between the mother and the father. And so it's just, it should be unspeakable. It's, it, it should be unthinkable. But you say, well, then, then why is it here? Are the children of Israel likely to be tempted particularly in this way? Well, I mean, we, we know the temptation comes to all peoples. That's a Genesis 3 reality. But the likelihood here is that either in Egypt, because remember the introduction, either in Egypt or in Canaan, far less sanction on such, an, such a sin, far less sanction on such an illicit uh, sexuality, or perhaps even, perhaps even, an indulgence of it. In verse 8, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, it is your father's nakedness. Now you say, well, he already talked about my mother. I said, by the wife, that's the same person, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, your, your first thought might be polygamy. That is probably not the, the first and foremost means here because polygamy, though, uh, you, you know, it was experienced in the history of Israel. It was not normative. Uh, for basically, even for, well, I mean, it wasn't morally normative as Jesus made clear. But it wasn't even demographically normative because of socioeconomics. It just doesn't work. There aren't that many. There isn't a surplus of women uh, to that extent. Not going to happen. So instead, it's serial monogamy in most cases where the assumption here would normally be that this man's mother has died. His father has married another woman. And in, 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 in Israel, it would be very common for this to be a younger woman, primarily because that would be, would be available, and also because, remember, the reproductive urgency, uh, which comes in Genesis 1, is a vital urgency for the children of Israel, who need as many children as possible to be able to go into the land of promise. And so... This is likely another woman who is now married to his wife, and she is off limits as well, again, because it would, uh, it would not only be a violation against her, but against the father. In verse 9, the sister, you shall not uncover the nakedness of, of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter. So again, it's, uh, you know, this, this, this means any sister, <laughs> and that would include half-sisters, uh, any sister is completely off limits. And again, that, that should be very plain. And as a matter of fact, as we know in Scripture, the law that God put within us, the, 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 the law in the, written on the heart, the conscience, in every single society, it's very interesting, there, there isn't a single society in which the incest taboo, as Freud called it, is not found. It tells us something about the Imago Dei, <clears throat> something about the the law written on the heart, but it, it's also written in the law. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, your mother's daughter, whether brought up in the family or in another home. So again, it's not, it's not the fact that you did not grow up with her does not mean that you have any right to her. Verse 10, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter or of your daughter's daughter for their nakedness is your own nakedness. So you bring shame upon yourself now in the same way that you would have brought shame upon your, your, your father. Now you bring shame upon yourself in the sense that you're supposed to be the protector of, uh, of those who would be the daughter-in-law by, uh, by either side. And uh, thus this too is a horrifying sin. In verse 12, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. She is your father's relative. You shall not uncover, verse 13, the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is your mother's relative. Okay? 
We need to go on just a little bit further to get the entire set. Verse 14, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. That is, you shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. So you'll notice this goes up and out, and, and it goes down and out. As you think about a chart of, of, of relatives, it goes up to the, the, uh, the generation before you, and it covers your mother and your father, but it also covers, it, it also covers that is to say, uh, those who would be aunts. So, and again, uncles don't need to be referenced here because this is addressed to men, and we're about to get to that in a moment. But uh, in other words, that, that's, that's an abomination beyond even the reference here in the beginning. This is an assumption that the greatest moral vulnerability, the likelihood of sin, is going to be the proximity of females to whom a male does not have right. The Bible is very, very candid about the danger of such a situation. And so these are, these are ants, and the ants come by you know, father, sister, mother, sister, or even uh, either mother or father's brother's wife. Okay. So that, that, that's going up and then out, and then we're about to go down the, the you might say the genealogy, the genealogy table and then, and, and then go out again. In verse 15, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. Okay? Then verse 16, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. 17, you shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter, and you shall not take her son's daughter or your daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. They are relatives. It is depravity. And you shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. Okay, here's the thing. You know, you, you just think of imagination, math. You just do math. You can come up with a uh, the, what are the odds, right? <laughs> you know, the people are going to get to this. Well, remember, this is a fairly small civilization. This is, a, this is a tribal society. These are people who are right now basically in the, in the wilderness wandering. They are, they're living in tents. The proximity to everybody is very close. They're not in Canaan. And when they get in Canaan, they will not live so closely together. The problem is they'll have in proximity to themselves Canaanites, about whom at this point, most of them would have, well, in fact, virtually all of them would have no personal uh, knowledge of the Canaanites yet. But God knows them full well. And God is saying, when you, when you get there, it's one of the reasons why they had to tear down all the Canaanite high places, as we saw already in Leviticus. And they are un... un uh, able they are commanded not to even reconsecrate or reuse a canaanite high place where horrible sexual sin was often ritualized and in cultic carnality and even as they're to drive the canaanites out of the land the lord will tell them and you see this in the historical books you, you you've got to drive their idols out of the land and you've got to drive their idolatrous carnal practices out of the land and and, and so <laughs> very strange stuff was going on and as you look at this you recognize there's just so much here that it has to be said that frankly it's just uncomfortable that it's embarrassing to humanity isn't it I mean aren't, aren't we kind of embarrassed that we even have to read this that God would even have to say this daughter-in-law brother's wife in verse, in verse 16, you know, if you violate your daughter-in-law, you, you've uncovered the nakedness also of your son. If you violate your sister-in-law also of your, of your brother. Verse 17 is interesting because it says you shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter... And that, that extends further than that even. You should not take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. So this is a third generation. And uh, just really important. Uh, and remember how Leviticus uh, 18 began by saying you, you shall not uncover the nakedness of a close relative. It turns out we really do. Israel really did need definition to exactly what that means. And so now if you think of 
the generation before, that is father and mother, aunts covered also here, and now we're down to basically four generations after the original parents who are in this structure. You can understand this is supposed to be very clear to Israel, no means no. Close means close. We have a repetition as you get to verse 19, what we already know. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual uncleanness. And you shall not be lie sexually with your neighbor's wife and so make yourself unclean with her. So what, what we already knew was the prohibition of sexual activity during the menstrual period of uncleanness. We, we already knew of the command against adultery. And that's made very clear here with the neighbor's wife. But then 21, it's like a swerve. Or, or, or to us, it could appear to be a swerve. You think, okay, <laughs> okay, he's talking about sexual relations that are forbidden. And he's told us no close relative. And that was kind of embarrassing enough. Uh, but then the Lord tells Moses, okay, we got to be real specific about this because these people are otherwise not going to fully understand what is required of them and, and, and how they are to honor. Remember that all this is against the background. If this dishonors God and we're called to honor God, then we are called not only not to do these things, but we are called to hate what God hates and to love what God loves. So this is a way of ingraining in God's people lessons of what we should hate. You should hate this. When you see temple prostitution, you don't just go, oh, that's anthropologically sad. That's theologically aberrant. No, your instinct is to go, God hates that. We're to hate what God hates. We're to, we're to hate that. And by the way, hating that is not just making a moral judgment. Hate means we do not allow ourselves to find any pleasure or wrongful interest in that. One of the strange things about Christian ethics that you, that you learn and, and about uh, human beings as ethical beings is that ethics is, when we think about it, of course, a rational activity. But ethics, as it's lived out, is usually not an analytical or an intellectual activity. You say, well, what are you talking about? I will, I will just tell you straightforwardly that I do not know a major ethicist on planet Earth, including Christian ethicists, who will not tell you that the majority of ethical acts are by intuition, not by intellectual activity. Uh, you might say even by instinct. Okay. So let's bring in one of the strangest witnesses we could bring into Sunday school this morning. He's neither a Christian nor a believer. He described himself as a godless Jew. His name is Sigmund Freud. Let's just bring him in for a moment, okay? Let's just bring Freud into Third Avenue Baptist Church, uh, trailing his cigar smoke as he walks along and uh, looking at us quizzically. And we, we bring in Sigmund Freud, and we say, Freud, Freud, what do you mean when you talk about moral intuition? And he will say, well, I'll tell you the, the, the most important moral intuition, there's an ethical issue, and, uh, and, and, and it is something that is found in every single civilization that has ever survived. It, it, it is found in such a way that most cultures never even have to say it. You do not eat feces. And you're looking at me going, this is church. <laughs> yes, it is. He would also come back, and I made reference to it earlier to say, that in, and he, he just called it a taboo. In other words, there's no moral command. There's, there's no God as a part of the picture. It's just a taboo. The, the, he would say there's, there's not a civilization on earth that does not have an incest taboo. Now, by the way, we as Christians, again, this, this is what we believe is that the moral constitution in which God made us. This is, this, is, this is the conscience that God gave us. It's a part of the imago dei. We also believe it's a part of natural revelation, as Paul makes clear in Romans chapter 1, that in the human heart, even the, the fallen sinful human heart, still has a knowledge that it cannot not know. But my point is most of it's by intuition. You know, parents who are parenting children, parents who are, are raising children, they have to think analytically all the time. They have to think intellectually all the time. But they can't analyt and they can't intellect 
to keep up with a living child. A lot of it's got to be by instinct. This is on campus yesterday, and we were surrounded by, uh, by fathers and mothers and their young children who were all, all over. This is a beautiful day. We were there to uh, actually welcome the mayor uh, who had come to thank students and, and faculty for involvement in the 1937 project. And it was a beautiful day, and all these families were out there. And, 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 and I saw something and, and just thought of it as I was thinking about being here. It was a father, and he had two, two little children who were just there. And, uh, and when, when we were just walking up and the children were kind of running around, you know, he just, he just kind of takes his hands and, and you know, pulls his children close. And we were just talking for a moment. And because I was, I was thinking these things, I thought, okay, there's a picture of it right there. I don't think he thought, okay, I got I to gotta maybe make sure I know where they are while I'm talking here. Uh, I got to make sure they just don't run off. I don't think he thought about what he was doing, right? Because he had to think about it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to do anything else. It's just what was it? intuition. Intuition. He's got these two little children. He's about to talk to an, another adult. Uh, they're going to run off. So he just pulls them close for a moment. In the same way, we morally operate. I mean, parents. Parents operate by intuition. But frankly, to be humans to operate by intuition a great deal of the time. It's part of the reason why being raised as a child, being raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord at home, means you're just basically you know, kind of doing your best to drive those intuitions in as deep as, as possible so that they're just there. Leon Cass, who's a very famous Jewish uh, scholar, and by the way, he does believe in, in God. He's a, he's a, he, he is not an, a, uh, an atheist. Uh, Leon Cass was chairman of the uh, Council on uh, Bioethics for President Bush, and uh, an incredible conservative Jewish thinker. And uh, his most important academic insight is uh, reducible to something every nine-year-old can understand, and frankly, every nine-year-old boy has a dual relationship with. It's the yuck factor. So Leon Cass says that to be human and to be a human civilization is to have a highly tuned yuck factor. In other words, if there's nothing that the society looks at and just goes, yuck, then that's a society that's coming apart. By the way, we're living in that society, which was his point. We're living in a society which is subverting the ability to, to say, yuck. I was talking about this not long ago and just talking about, you know, a mom on, uh, who uh, asked me, she said, as a young seminary wife, and they had two, two little children and another in a stroller. They were in the park, two men sitting on the park bench kissing each other, just locked on, you know, a romantic kiss, and, you know, the son who was like 10, just walking along with mom, saw this in the park, and just inaudible <laughs> response right in front of these two men just went and went, yuck. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the family, the mother was going, oh, you know, what, what do we do here? And I said, well, number one, that's biblical. Number two, Leon Cass would be very proud. <laughs> Professor at the University of Chicago. He's not impressed by much, but he would have been impressed by that. Because that's a sign of civilization. That, that's a sign of moral judgment. It's actually necessary for a civilization to survive. And so what I want you to see here is that a part of what's going on here is that God is giving this law through Moses to the people in such a way that they will at the right moment, if not audibly, then just as powerfully feel yuck. A society that doesn't say yuck is a society that will never say no. Okay, we're headed into very important territory here in terms of contemporary issues. We saw in verse 20, and you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife and so make yourself unclean with her. Then quickly, verse 21, as if this just flows immediately, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech and so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. So verse 21, what in the world is this? Who is Molech? 
Molech was a Canaanite idol to whom children were sacrificed through burning in a fire. And uh, so some years ago, as they were, as I recall, extending the airport runway in, uh, in Syria, uh, in Damascus, the, the airport, they came across an archaeological ruin, and the archaeological ruin was evidently a furnace. And so the archaeologists looking at this and, and, and trying to figure out about the furnace noticed that the bones in the furnace were of humans aged two and under. And they noticed that the bones of these children aged two and under had been broken at the femur. So that these children were sacrificed to Molech such that their legs were broken so that they could not crawl out of the furnace. That's a horrifying thing you can imagine. And you would think Israel would not have to be told, you do not sacrifice your children to Molech. But you know, this is a part of God's grace to us, is in saying to us what we might think at any given time. We do not need said to us. We know this. Well, okay. The word is a gift. Because we will forget what we know. It's one of the reasons why the testimony of the word of God is so absolutely necessary. But that, that's what, exactly what's going on in this verse. It's sacrifice of children to Molech. And in doing so, you would profane the name of the Lord your God, which is you would say God is who he is not. This is profane. We're talking about profanity. What is profaning the name of God? Very important Old Testament principle. It means saying that God is who he is not. Saying that God demands what he does not demand. You, you assault the character of God by saying you're doing this in God's name, which is another way. You take, you, it takes us back to the Ten Commandments and, and understanding that uh, we're, we're told we're not to take the Lord's name in vain. That does not mean merely don't cuss. I think that was the limit of my grandmother's understanding. But it means you don't say things that are about God that are wrong because then you misidentify him. You do not attribute to God things that are said that he did not say because that, that corrupts him. Okay. But then look at verse 22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. If you take all the texts in the Bible that are definitively about male homosexuality, you would find primarily that those texts are Leviticus chapter 18, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, Romans 1. And they are unequivocal. In, uh, in Romans chapter 1, it is not just male homosexuality, but the only instance in the entire ancient world where female same-sex desire and same-sex orientation are mentioned, the only time in the entire ancient world in which there is an undeniable, unequivocal, unquestionable reference to female homosexuality is in Romans chapter 1. Women exchanging the natural use of the man instead of attracted to one another. And, and, and men doing the same thing against nature. Now, what we, we, we've got to talk about stuff here we cannot avoid talking about, sorry. But the distinction between male sexual activity and female sexual activity in, involves the difference being the man's ability and urgency to penetrate. And so that's why it is, it is mentioned in a way, in other words, that's clearly classified as a sexual activity in the way that in the ancient world, they did not know what to do with, with sexual activity that did not involve penetration. And thus, and thus, when you had two women, is that sex or is it not? Well, it's interesting. The Bible answers that conclusively. Romans chapter 1. So we're living in a day, of course, in which you've got two things that uh, were, were not present in Canaan, except maybe they sort of were. One is modern biblical liberal scholarship, and the other is an LGBTQ movement. And uh, you know, I've written entire books on this. I'm going to, you know, we won't have, we don't have time, nor is it the right time to go through all of this. I'll just tell you that there's war on this verse. And let me tell you how the war on this verse comes about. By the way, this verse is unambiguous. Is there anyone who's confused about what this verse is about? I don't think so. 
So uh, having written books on this and, te and uh, teaching on this and lecturing on this all over, I, I have to collect bad arguments. And you know, some of the bad arguments coming from, so if you want to get over this, if you want to normalize homosexuality in some sense in which you have to engage scripture. So if you're a liberal Jewish synagogue, uh, reform Judaism, or for that matter now, conservative Judaism, and just, that's in quotation, quotation marks, it's not really conservative, it's just what it labels itself. Um, and, uh, or if, if, if you're a liberal Protestant or a liberal Catholic and, 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 and you want to find a way around this text, you know, how do they do it? Well, one of the ways they do it is to say that as you look at uh, Leviticus 18 and uh, verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. So, I, and I refreshed my memory of this last night just because I wanted to be able to document it. And, and there's one particular uh, uh, liberal scholar who says, look, that means live in the house with. And I just wonder, you know, or, or lie with is in share a bed with. I mean, it, it, just, it just makes no sense. You just look at this and you go, how can you say it with a straight face? That, 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 that isn't even possible. Because it's not, like that, it's not like that verbal construction has ever been used before. And there's absolutely no doubt what it means in every previous verse. So it's completely illegitimate to say, okay, here, swerve. But, you know, if, if people are looking for an argument, all they're looking for sometimes is a fig leaf of an argument. You know, they'll run off with that. Um, and, of course, the other thing here is that there are those who say, well, this is only, this is only, remember the context of cultic prostitution and cultic carnality? This is only a, uh, a prohibition against some kind of sacred, idolatry-referenced, you know, same-sex activity. But again, it's not that at all. That, 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 it's not that at all. Instead, it's just straightforward. You shall not, in fact, it's so clear, it, it's so absolutely clear that you don't really need any commentary on it. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. Okay, got it. But then the Lord says it is an abomination. Now, the word abomination is the strongest word in the Old Testament for sin. And that doesn't mean there are little sins and big sins in, in terms of our moral responsibility. But it does mean that there are Sins, and then there are abominations in the lie against God's character. So the worst sin imaginable is a lie that misrepresents God. Okay, so clear. My dad had the talk with me, one of many talks, father-son talks, and this subject had come up in the news in which the word homosexual was used. And I, I don't know, I was probably 10 or 11 years old, but evidently I was asking about it, had no idea what it was. My dad decided, my dad's way of doing this was to walk, okay? When he says I was going to take a walk, at a certain point in life I recognized we're going into uncharted territory, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm safe with dad, so this is, this is all right. Okay, so dad tried to explain in very summary, Christian, wonderful, faithful Christian dad to 10-year-old son in 1969, I guess. You know, just tried to say, okay, here's what you need to know. Well, all I can tell you is it did not compute. I think I knew less after the talk <laughs> than before the talk, and I knew nothing before the talk. Now, I actually know less than nothing. I am so thoroughly confused. But you know what? It was a moral instinct that he successfully communicated one heart to another. There was a moral judgment about such things that I can remember as if we're on that walk right now. It was not ad hominem. It was not mean. It was just clear. And, I, you know, he did not go into any lengthy biblical explanation of the word abomination but that's basically what he was communicating and with all the limited understanding of a 10 year old boy in 1969 i got the abomination part so this is just another very clear instruction and command to god's people and similarly when you come to verse 23 it's just bestiality you shall not lie with any animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. 
Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. So that's another word, perversion. And you say, what is perversion? It, it is the warping of something into what it was not meant to be. So that, that's what it is. So if you take a, if you take a, a, well, you would think the metaphors would just be rich here. Uh, <laughs> if you take a door and nail it shut, you've perverted the door. It's no longer a door. It's now a wall. Just trying to think of something simple, which isn't necessarily moral. It's just to say it is, first of all, understanding in moral terms, it is taking something that's supposed to be this and perverting it into something else. It is a perversion. The bestiality is the most graphic example of a perversion. It's not to say the other things before this aren't perversions. It, it is just to say, again, the order of creation. Just think of Genesis 1. You don't, all you have to know is, you know, like 30 verses of Scripture, the first, say, 30 verses of Scripture, and you got this. All right, very quickly, as time's running out. Summary at the end, you shall, or just do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by these, the nations I'm driving out before you become unclean. So you have the distinction between the clean and the unclean, the holy and the unholy. God is pushing out the unholy, but you know what? His people going in, it better be holy because they bear his reputation. You know, those he's casting out are those, they bear the reputations of all the false idols. And well, let the, let the reputation of those false idols go with them. It, it better not be that God's people, Yahweh's people, the people of the one true and living God would offer any such false witness. And in 25, the dangers of the land would become unclean so that I punished its iniquity and the land vomited out its inhabitants. This is one of my favorite verses in scripture. I can remember when I read this the first time. I think I was reading through the scripture at verse 13 and I thought of the land vomiting out its people. And uh, if you think about a Roman stadium, Roman stadium, uh, like the Colosseum, the people who came through the great entrances in which people would just come through, they were called vomitoria. And architecturally, they still are. If you go to the Super Bowl or you go to a, you go to a major college game and you know, all those entrances you have to go through from the back of the stands up to the front of the stands, all these people come out to the original classical architects. It looked like buildings vomiting out human beings. Well, in the same way, the land will vomit out such people. Instead, you shall keep my statutes and my rules and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you, for the people of the land who were before you did all these abominations so that the land became unclean. And then we're back to vomit in verse 28. Lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. So there's a great moral principle here. And I think everyone in this room can understand the vomit principle. And that is that those who give themselves to such things are not only to face the judgment of God, they will one way or another be vomited out of the land. By the way, there's no assurance that the United States of America lasts another hundred years. There's every biblical evidence that a society that gives itself to such things will eventually be vomited out of the land. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the persons who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you and never to make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. So that's how the text begins in chapter 18, verse 1. The Lord says, as he speaks to Moses, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. The end of the chapter, after this particular series of commandments, references, and teachings to the moral code by which Israel is to live, displacing the people vomited out of the land, lest they be vomited out. The Lord comes to the conclusion of this oration to Moses and says, I am the Lord. He is the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for all you've given us in this single chapter of Scripture that begins and ends with the truth that you are the Lord. Father, as our Lord, we come before you to pray that our hearts, our lives, this church, our families, 
all of us as your people would live in such a way that we would not only meet, but by your great grace, vastly exceed what is required in this chapter. But Father, may this chapter live in our hearts in such a way that it warns us and drives the right intuitions into us. It'll be to your glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.